again. So if you're using the TI-84, which is what we always use from, from with me, right? Um, your calculator tricks are the following. Now there's three situations that you guys are using. So I'm gonna say this gives Oops, test statistic and p-value. I'm gonna try to organize it. And then this one gives critical value. Now I want you to obviously know the abbreviation now because I'm using the abbreviation, but I have it all here if you forget. Um, so your three situations are the same as what you had for confidence intervals. So you're either doing a claim about a proportion, p, population proportion, or you have a claim about a population average, mu, and again, either sigma is known or sigma is unknown. So it's the same like three situation as what you had last um, week with confidence intervals. It's just now obviously you have hypothesis testing. Now these calculated tricks, you, they should look familiar because every time I go to, where is it? My TI-84 and last week you guys did confidence intervals, right? You went to stat, you went to test. All this stuff, guess what it is? Now remember I told you all this stuff in the beginning, you're gonna see, you guys you know, passed it for intervals, but now we're not gonna pass it. We're gonna, we're gonna use them. So um, if it ends in test, it goes with a hypothesis test. If it ends in interval, it goes with an interval, a confidence interval. So if you're doing one for a proportion, it's one prob Z test. If you're doing for a mean, if sigma is known, it's Z test. If sigma is unknown, it's T test. It's not very different from confidence interval, it's except that it ends in test instead of interval or int. If you want your critical value, then for proportion, you would use inverse norm and you would use Z scores, right? I'm going to say Z and whatever. Um, if it's sigma is known and it's a mean, then it's inverse norm again. People always forget this inverse norm stuff. If sigma is unknown, then it's a T, inverse T. Okay, um, let me see. Oh, damn. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you told me that. I'm sitting here talking, it's like not even showing. <laughs> so I was talking about this while I wasn't showing my screen. So the three situations, again, <laughs> the three situations was proportion, mean, sigma is known, sigma is unknown, right? Same idea, um, one prop Z test, Z test or T test. So remember, and I showed this, and <laughs> last week you guys went to stat and test, and I told you that all this stuff up here you're going to use, and you scrolled past it to get all the interval stuff, but now we're not going to scroll past it. We're going to use this test stuff. So again, anything that ends in test goes with hypothesis testing. Anything end that ends with interval or int goes with confidence intervals. And then um, your calculator trick that ends in test will either give a test statistic and a p-value. So that's your trick, because otherwise um, you use um, formulas to find test statistic. And there's another way that you could find p-values that I probably need to talk about as well, but I need to talk about maybe after we actually do an example. Because um, once you know the calculator trick, you don't use the old school way to find the p-value, but it co goes along with this idea that the p-value is the area that goes along with the test statistic. But for now, I'm gonna use the calculator trick. And then your critical values, if it's a proportion, it's inverse norm. If it's a mean and sigma is known, it's inverse norm, sigma is unknown, inverse T. So very similar to what you did um, last week. So let's see if I could run through, maybe just finding the values for this, maybe not interpreting yet, we'll see. So let's read this, I don't know, I didn't even read this. Uh, pink, nah, blue. All right, <clears throat> let's go. Now, it says hypothesis test with a known standard deviation. I'm gonna leave that for now, but later on, you're gonna have to pull that information from the actual word problem. It's not gonna tell you this initial part. So I'll kind of give you an idea how you can do that, um, but you, you know, you wanna get used to that. You wanna get used to not depending on, not to being dependent on knowing the section that we're in because obviously your test is gonna mix it up. Can I make that a little? That's kind of cramped. All right. So let's see. After many years of commuting, Susie, well, Susie knows that uh, 
that the can buy <laughs> that she or I think they had a typo there. Susie knows that she can bike to her office in 17 minutes with a standard deviation of one minute. While shopping, she finds an all natural energy drink and decides to use it to shorten her commute time. This is the first time I'm reading this. Susie records 12 morning commutes with an average time of this, in which she drank the energy drink before biking. Is there sufficient evidence to show that the energy drink helped conduct the hypothesis test at the 5% significance level? Cute, cute. All right. <laughs> All right, so after many years of commuting, overall, she knows that she can bike to her office. Um, I guess they meant that the mean time, mean time that she can bike, I don't know what happened with that, but that the mean time that she can bike to her office is 17 minutes on average. So I'm going to say that the population standard deviation is 17, right? Um, overall, actually, I might move this up here just because it comes from that with a standard deviation of one minute. So this is a population standard deviation because her population is basically overall all these years of commuting. So without, you know, knowing this, without me being told this, I'm going to determine that sigma is known because there's discussion about like um, an all kind of case. All these years that she's commuting, this is the mean and the standard deviation. Um, while shopping, this now the, under this condition, she's trying to shorten her commute. She records 12 morning commutes. So she has a sample of commutes where she has this energy drink. So her sample size is 12. Um, these 12 morning commutes have an average time of 16.5 minutes. That's a sample mean, X bar. So from her little sample, <laughs> her average time was 16.5 minutes. Is there sufficient evidence to show that the energy drink helped? So I'm going to claim that <laughs> her average time is less than 17, what she would have. Average time with, you know, with the energy drink, okay? So her average time with the energy drink is less than 17 minutes, which she would do without it. So that's my claim. That's basically what she wants to test, right? Again, I hear a claim. I'm, I'm thinking about a test. You're going to automatically go here. What is my null and my alternative hypothesis? And this is the notation for null and alternative hypothesis. H-O, null. And this H-A, sometimes you see H-1 as alternative hypothesis, they're both the same. I just like HA because it's alternative hypothesis. So there should be an A in it, right? That's just how I think. Um, <laughs> so what is the claim about? It's about an average for a population where she has an energy drink, right? And the claim is that this average should be less than 17. Well, a less than symbol should go on my alternative. Less than 17 minutes. My null should always have the equal. So that is an example of how I pull my null and my alternative hypothesis from these word problems, a lot of word problems. Now, just in case it's possible for you to see the, uh, the null hypothesis with a greater than or equal to sign instead of just equals for this particular book. I think what they used to do, you know, in statistics is just is have the greater than or equal to or the less than or equal to. They convert it to just equal to on the null and like some books might use this, some books might use that. So your particular book, I think, uses a little bit of this because I saw that in some of your assignments. So um, the null, again, though, is always carrying the equal to portion. So the alternative follows this because it says less than. <laughs> and then the null hypothesis would be equal or greater than or equal to. So this is my null and my alternative. Now, what kind of test do I have? So I have my, um, my alternative pointing to the left. And I said when the alternative points to the left or has a less than, then it's a left tail test. So I'm going to write that. What kind of test is it? This is a left tailed test. And remember that 
you know, these questions, they can ask for any portion of this. They can ask for this or this. They can ask you what kind of test. Um, based on the fact that it's left tailed, let me go back here. I want to draw my my rejection region, OK, because I want to find my critical value. So <clears throat> I'm going to draw that. So it's a left tailed test. Right. I'm in the left tail. I didn't determine if it was a T distribution or a Z distribution yet, or at least I have determined it, but I haven't talked about it. Um, <clears throat> and this is my rejection region because it's a left tail test. Um, my critical value is going to separate my rejection region from the rest, just like this says, right? It's a left tail test. My critical value here separates the area to the left, which is called the rejection region. Now you notice that I put alpha here as well, because alpha represents the area of the rejection region. So do I have alpha? Do they give it to me? Alpha is your significance level. So I'm going to write that. Being that we're conducting a hypothesis test at the 5% significance level, my alpha is 5% or 0 0.05. And I'll talk about interpreting that or um, maybe later. We'll see. Um, but that would tell me that this area here is 0 0.05 because this is my rejection region. So <laughs> all this is going to give me my critical value. The only thing that's left is to de determine if the critical value um, is a Z or a T. Do I use inverse norm or do I use inverse T? So being that I'm running a test about a mean, then I'm going to get rid of this. It's one of these. It's got to be one of these. And I did already say that sigma was known, which means sigma is known. If I want my test statistic and my p-value, I would use z-test. And if I want my critical value, I would use inverse norm. So my critical value is a z-score. This is a standard normal distribution curve because I'm using z-scores. And to find it, I would do inverse norm. And being that the area is to the left already, I would just put that in. So go to my graphing calculator. I need to find my critical value first. I'm going to find it first, whether they ask me or not, whatever. Second bars is my critical value, <coughs> if you remember that. I um, always get questions about critical values um, when we get to hypothesis testing, because like you forget inverse norm for some reason. But inverse norm area was 0 0.05, my significance level. Here's my picture, right? And it's the area to the left. My mean is zero. My standard deviation is one. Do not confuse this, okay, with this. So they may have given me this stuff up here, but when a z-score is talked about or discussed, or if I'm looking for a z-score, I'm automatically on a standard normal distribution curve. So this particular critical value, being that it's a z-score, has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. I'm not using this stuff up here. It's going to give you the wrong value, okay? Anytime is why I stress this when we started to talk about standard normal distribution. Anytime I talk about standard normal distribution, I'm automatically saying that a mean is zero and standard deviation of one is one. I'm automatically talking about z-scores. If I'm talking about z-scores, I'm automatically on a standard normal distribution curve, so on and so forth, okay? So don't confuse that with this because you're finding a critical value, a z-score, okay? And it's that. So it makes sense that with the left tailed test, the critical value would be negative because it's in the left tail. Negative 1.645. They don't tell me how to round, do they? Yeah. Okay. So this is how I find my critical value. So again, my, my um, alternative hypothesis is left tailed. So you could draw this right away if you want. My rejection region is area to the left of the critical value. And my alpha is the area of that rejection region. If you're if you're so I'll show you on this one. So second bars um, inverse norm. This one doesn't have it. All you have to do is put um, where is it? The 0 0.05 because it's area to the left. And then if you don't put you know zero and one it automatically does standard normal distribution if you haven't noticed that yet. 
<coughs> if it's outside of standard normal, then I'm going to continue. So you get the same value. If it were a right tail test, if this were in the right tail, you would put that one minus. So, okay, cool. Um, all right, that's just finding the critical value for now. Next, let's talk about the test statistic and the p-value because you may be asked to find that. And I told you that the test statistic and the p-value, and I have that here, if you want to find a test statistic and a p-value, that's with these, right? These calculator tricks. So we're doing the mean where sigma is known, so I would use z-test. So I'm going to put z-test over here, okay? Z test. And the test statistic is also a z-score because remember when I talked about the difference between, uh, where is it, these two methods, the test statistic is also a value on the horizontal scale. So if we're on a standard normal distribution curve, then it is a z-score just like the critical value is. So when I go to, let's do it, z-test, Oh okay, we go to stat, test, and z-test is the first thing that comes up. And again, you're going to be asked data versus stats, just like you did last week. I'm not using data because I don't have a list of values. I actually have statistical values, so I'm going to scroll over so that stats is highlighted. Notice that if I'm using z-test, it asks for sigma. Now, there's a little bit more that it asks for, okay? So, first thing that it says, mu naught. This is the value that we're running the test or comparing the test to, if that makes sense. Basically, what's here? So, what are we, you know, comparing, you know, our average to? What are we running the test about? In this case, 17, so 17. Okay, whatever's here is what goes first. Sigma was one. Sample mean was 16.5. This was all given in the problem. Um, my n was 12. And then you see this part here. It says not equal to, less than, or greater than. And that's basically the, hypoth the alternative hypothesis. So this is the left tail test. So it's asking me what kind of test it is. So I need to scroll down and scroll over to where it says less than. You don't care about color, calculate, or draw. You don't have to draw anything. Calculate. Okay, now let me take a screenshot of this. This is my output. So this is how I interpret this stuff. So the output of all these things that end in tests are very similar, meaning that, put this down here. Mm, I'll use pink. So the first thing that you see should match your alternative hypothesis, right? Mu is less than 17. That's the kind of test that you have. The next thing that you get is your test statistic. It's a z-score. So my test statistic, I'll put it in pink here, is negative 1.732. The next thing is my p-value. It's always in this order, okay? It's always alternative hypothesis, test statistic, p-value. My p-value here is 0 0.0416. So technically what this is giving me is the test statistic in that area, in this case, to the left of that because it's a left tail test. That's what this is giving me. I don't have to go through like, you know, if I were to find p-value, I'd have to use normal CDF, right, to find that area. But this does it for me. And then some of the statistical values that match. <clears throat> so it technically gives me everything I need to make my conclusion. And you know what? I'll make my conclusion. Let's conclude. I don't even know what I just typed. I think I put something on the sort. <laughs> so let's determine our conclusion based on that. And I, I'll talk about both of the um, both of the methods, okay? Conclusion. Um, okay. I'm going to use, I guess I'm going to draw it on here, actually, since I want to talk about both methods, let me bring this down. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to do like the traditional method here. 
I'm going to focus. I can't spell right now. Traditional. <laughs> the traditional method here. And then I'll do the p-value method here. Okay. So. Traditional method. I'm going to actually copy and paste this. Because I need that for my traditional method. Hopefully I can bring all that down. Okay, good. And I'm going to narrow it down to just the critical value and the value there. So I have my rejection region. Um, I have my critical value, I have my alpha. My critical value here is, so the value corresponding to this location, separating the rejection region from the rest is negative 1.645. My test statistic, I'll put in pink, <coughs> excuse me. My test statistic is negative 1.732. So now you have to figure out, sometimes I have students asking me questions based on the fact that like they can't determine where the test statistic is compared to the critical value. So think of this as a number line, okay? As you move from left to right, your values increase. So a negative 1.7 is less than negative 1.6 with the negative values. So my test statistic is technically over there in the left tail to the left of the critical value because it is a value that is less than negative 1.645. The p-value is this area here. I don't need to do it with um, normal CDF. It's already given to me, but that's that p-value area to the left of that also. Now, being that my test statistic um, is within the rejection region, right? Because it's in there, it's in that area. Then I'm going to reject the null. It's in the region to reject, I'm rejecting. Okay, that's the traditional method. If the test statistic is within the rejection region, we are rejecting the null hypothesis. Hopefully it doesn't seem as bad as I initially, right? It's not that bad. My p-value method is basically doing the same thing but I don't need to draw the picture because it's literally just like, is it less than alpha or greater than alpha? So the nice thing is that I show it here too, but the p-value was 0.0416 and the alpha was a 5% significance level. And you're comparing again two decimals, but this value is less than that, right? 0.04 is less than 0.05. And so when the p-value is less than or equal to alpha, when, we, when it's less, we reject the null. So I come to the same conclusion, right, regardless of which method I'm using. And that should be true. So if you're asked to use the traditional method, you might not be asked directly. You might be asked basically what the critical value is less than, you know, uh, like something like the critical value of negative 1.645 is less than the test statistic of negative 1.732. And therefore, we reject the null. They're not going to basically say using the traditional method. It's not going to be like that. But because you're comparing the test statistic and the critical value, you know it's the traditional method. If they say because the p-value and like drop down, drop down here, I think, is less than alpha of 0.05. I think they have drop downs for the p-value method. We're rejecting the known. So my conclusion is that I am rejecting the null hypothesis, H0. Okay. Every time I say reject the null, I say there is sufficient evidence to support the alternative, which I need to be more detailed about, but I'm rejecting the null. So there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that I forgot what the claim was. Okay, it says mu is less than 17. What was that about? That the average time that she commutes with the energy drink is less than 17. That the average commute time after her energy drink is less than 17 minutes for typical commute time. Okay. So I'll stop there for now. So there is a question, that same question is on one of these chapters. So the, the 1B, it says at the 5% significance.